Hi, my name is Dr. Alan Barnard. I'm CEO of Golden Research Labs. Have you ever wondered why good people make and often repeat bad decisions? Well, it turns out that we make bad decisions for very good reasons. So what are these good reasons? Well, the majority of the decisions that we make every day, both in our personal lives and at work, is actually made with intuition our fast and automatic mode of thinking. We're simply not thinking about it. We're just applying a simple decision rule that either we've evolved over a long time through learning or we've inherited from our forefathers. Unfortunately, sometimes we could really benefit from slowing down our thinking using our cognition, our slow and more deliberate mode of thinking. But of course, using cognition has its own pitfalls. So how do I decide whether to use intuition or cognition? My advice is very simple. Apply a simple check. If it's really important to make a good decision or really important that you understand why you or somebody else made a bad decision, then find a way of slowing down your thinking. Use cognition. Because we definitely don't want to make and repeat bad decisions all the time. So how do we use cognition without falling into its own common pitfalls like confirmation bias or overthinking? Well. I'm really excited to tell you that after almost a decade of field testing, I want to share a new decision support method we've developed based on the latest advancements in decision sciences and technology. It consists of just five simple steps. Each step has been designed to help us prevent the five most common mistakes we make when we make decisions using our intuition. I call the new method the Change Matrix Cloud. The cloud simply reflects that Problems that we face or decisions that we face can hang over us like dark clouds. And the change matrix, you'll see in the next slide why we call it a change matrix. So imagine this is you, you've got this dark cloud hanging over you, either problem that you're facing or decision that you've been procrastinating on. So what's the first mistake that we make? Is we work on the wrong problem. We don't work on the right problem and that wastes our scarcest and most precious resource, our limited attention. So what should step one be. It starts off by saying what is the problem that you're facing, either an expectation gap or a problem. Then it looks at what's the local impact of, of this problem. Why is it bad for you or your part? And then lastly the system impact. Why is it bad for other stakeholders, people that you care about or even for the organization? And then checking if you can understand how this can create a vicious cycle. For example, my problem is I might be overweight. The local impact, uh, why it's bad for me, it's the, I've developed type 2 diabetes. And why it's bad for others is my family worries about me, my kids might even be embarrassed to be seen with me. And of course that puts stress on me, my current cope with stress by eating, and that brings me back to being more and more overweight. What's the second mistake that we should be aware of? Is that even though we've identified that a problem is now really important and that by following the step we can prevent the first mistake, we often jump to a solution or we get stuck due to the ambivalence. Ambivalence, as I mentioned, is a, is a really uncomfortable emotion because we can see both the plus and the minus of something or someone and we get stuck. But we also make a mistake of jumping to just blaming somebody for causing our problem, whether it's ourselves or somebody else. So what should the st second step include to ensure that we don't make these two mistakes? Well, it starts off by defining just very clearly my conflict in resolving my problem. What is the solution or the change I feel pressure to make to solve the problem, like go on a diet or do more exercise or put in a new IT system or lower my prices? Then we look at what's the status quo or the alternative that is competing with us. And then we simply list the pluses of the change, the pluses of not changing and the goal that we're trying to achieve so we can judge the importance. And then the downside or the, or the cons of the change and the cons of not changing and the threat that either of those could trigger. And we finally then do a check that says, are these really unique? Are they important to us? And could it be that we've exaggerated them? But remember, we also make the mistake of jumping to blaming somebody. So can we use the same change matrix to understand why the person that we blamed, whether it's ourselves or somebody else, did what they did? Absolutely. 
So in this case, we are defining their conflict. We are looking at what action we believe caused our problem in the first place, maybe like a doctor giving us really bad advice about nutritional choices. And then in hindsight, what did we want them to do? What's the solution that could have prevented our problem? And again, repeating the process, listing the unique pros or positives of the change versus the not change and their goal in this case. So we can judge standing in their shoes if it's really important. And then the, the minuses or the cons or the downside of the change versus not change and the threat that this would put us into. That allows us to prevent the second mistake of either jumping to a solution or jumping to just blaming somebody. The third mistake that we make, mistake number three, is that we are trained to resolve conflicts by compromising. But compromising involves giving up stuff and we hate giving up stuff. So is there any way of resolving conflicts without giving up anything that's important to us? Absolutely. There's at least four options that we have to get more of the upside and less of the downside. I've given them names. Option one is change plus plus. What can I add to the change so I don't lose the positive of the status quo? And what can I add to the change so I don't get the negatives of the change? And then not change plus plus, the same, but just uh, looking at the maintaining the status quo so I don't lose the the plus of the change and maintaining the status quo and getting rid of the frustrations of the negatives of the status quo. And then when to change, when not to, being very clear about when and when not to change or looking at another change. And that will help us to prevent mistake number three. Mistake number four is that even if we have a brilliant solution, we sometimes ignore our own intuition about yes buts or we use them as excuses. So why don't we use our intuition or other people's yes buts and create a plan, listing the yes ands. What do I need to overcome each of these reservations? Building the plan so we can see clearly how we're going to achieve our objective. And that's step four. The last mistake that we make, and very common, is we do bad experiments. And when we do a bad experiment, we can't learn. How do I make sure I do a good experiment? It's by summarizing my full analysis that I've done so far as a guideline or almost a project chart that this is my experiment and then checking continuously. Have I solved the problem? Monitor the green parts that I want to achieve. Am I getting the, the upside and not getting the downside? So let me clarify quickly. How can you use steps one and two to tell us your story in a simple way? This is you. What's a dark cloud that you're experiencing it? a problem or decision or opportunity that's putting pressure on you to make a decision? What is the problem that you're facing? Why is it bad for you? Why is it bad for others? That validates it's an important problem. Then you go to step two. What's a conflict I face in dealing with a problem? What's a solution? And what's a competing status quo or an alternative solution? And listing the unique pros of the change, the unique pros of not changing or, or the alternative and what's my goal. So I can judge if they're really important and maybe whether I've exaggerated them. And then repeating it for the downside. What are unique cons of the change? What are unique cons of not changing? And what's the threat? So I can judge if it's really important to me. And then putting yourselves in the shoe of the ones that you blame. What's their conflict? Whether you blame yourself or somebody else. What action or non-action do you believe caused your problem? And what should they have done that could have prevented your problem? And listing again the unique pros and the unique cons of each of those. By filling in this very simple diagram, telling your story on one page, it helps us answer the question that we started with. Why do good people make and often repeat bad decisions? Well, we sometimes make bad changes, make bad decisions because of exaggerated frustrations or with the status quo or expectations. I think the, what we see in the politics around the world is a very good example of that, where people get so frustrated with the status quo or they've got such high exaggerated expectations of the changes that the politicians promise that they simply make a, a change that could end up being very bad for them. Of course, on the other side, why do we we often resist good changes because of exaggerated fears of loss and risk. And a diagram that diagonal can clearly identify what are we scared of losing. We're scared of losing the pros that we think are unique to the status quo that we'll have to give up. And we're scared of, of making the change because of the unique cons of the change. 
like for example the unique pros of continuing to smoke is maybe that I have a stress coping mechanism that I'm scared to lose and the unique cons of stopping smoking is that I'm scared that I will gain weight. Once we verbalize clearly these assumptions or beliefs, we bring them from the subconscious to the conscious mind, we can check them and challenge them. Is that really true? And even if it is really true, can I find a way of overcoming it? And that's the benefit that we get by doing steps one and step two. It helps to deepen our understanding about why we make and often repeat bad decisions and also those that we blame. Steps three, four and five that we can apply to each conflict is about how do I capitalize on this new insight to help us make better, faster decisions. I hope you found this video valuable and that you'd be encouraged to try these five simple steps. We have an app called the Harmony Decision Maker app that will guide you through these five simple steps. Just go to our website now, tellusyourstory.com and why not give it a try? and see if you can gain some new insights about why you or others have made or repeated bad decisions in order to gain those insights, capitalize on them, challenge those limiting and often harmful and exaggerated fears of frustration or, or expectations that will help you make better, faster decisions in the future. Thank you for listening.